Roster management for redraft and dynasty post week one. That's what we're talking about today on the show. We'll be talking about some waiver wire management, what you might want to look ahead for the rest of the season after week one and how to handle that, how to use your budget and so on and so forth. That's what we are going to dive into. As we kick off the show today, I just want to mention, I hope everyone listening is having a, a good week. I unfortunately, since we recorded our last show, got some tough news to you know take, to accept, and I'm working through that at the moment. So in case I seem off at any points of today's show as we work through it, I wanted to come on, get the third show of the week. Sean, talking on these shows, talking for the Road of His Overtime community, talking to you, Talking about football in general is, you know, one of my favorite things to do. And it's kind of, this week is going to be kind of a therapeutic talk through. So looking forward to diving in as we kind of talk some of our roster managements for our own teams, the Dynasty Reanimators team, which we haven't touched on in a little bit, and our main event team, along with some other stuff, which we'll bring into the more generalized picture. So we are recording this ahead of Thursday Night Football. I want to give a sneak here, Sean, as well. We recorded our show on tuesday usually that is the wednesday edition for anyone who has subscribed to the road of his overtime podcast feed they got that i think 3 p.m eastern on tuesday so just a little plug there to make sure you are subscribed you might get a little early upload from time to time so if you're listening to this who knows you may have got it before thursday night football if you're diving in and getting there nice and early and we're talking about thursday night football the one thing i do want to mention is Curtis and Dave, Curtis, Patrick, and Dave Cabin, they are streaming each Thursday up on the Road of His YouTube channel just prior to Thursday Night Football doing some start-sit conversations. They started at four week one. They are back this week for week two. So you might be listening to our show after Thursday Night Football, but it will still be available up there. They're doing it as a live stream each and every week. So check that out. You can submit your start-sit questions to them live on the air. Have a listen. Check it out. Two of the best in the business. Sean, we are ready for our third show of the week. Which direction are we taking this one? Well, Colin, I just wanted to say again how much I appreciate you and, and all those things. And certainly um, it was a reminder that Garrett Wilson not being in as good a situation um, after the Aaron Rodgers injury is far and away less important than a lot of other things that are going on and yeah it, re- it really changed my uh you know concerns about fantasy football teams heading into one night football anyway that's for sure yeah so but we still love this we still want to win we want to bring home that main event sean we do we do and our main event did well one of the things that we're looking at here i mean you and i not necessarily on purpose we would have loved to have drafted these players but we did dodge both the jk dobbins and the garrett wilson elements on our specific team Colin the thing that you and I are looking at really comes down to the quarterback position this didn't end up being one of the teams where we have Jalen Waddle and so there was less of an incentive to draft two and not that we didn't still feel like he was three or four or five rounds undervalued but just that you know when you see the injury to J.K. Dobbins when you see the injury to Aaron Rodgers it reminds you that if you have you know, a, a player like Tua on every single team. Now, it's a little bit different at the quarterback position because there are going to be some other ways to play it. But you are looking to mix up how you go about this a little bit. Unfortunately, the QB position might be the weakest one for us. Jerry Goff didn't hit in week one. Sam Howell looked good and yet didn't necessarily look like a fantasy league winner in week one. And that's going to influence how you put together your roster one of the things that you and i had talked about and i had kind of been pushing for was this idea of let's do the four qbs if we end up not getting a stud and see how that develops it's going to depend a lot on some of the other portions of your roster so colin you and i are lucky enough to have travis Etienne and ramondre stevenson as potential starters this week ramondre did lose more of the touches to ezekiel elliott than we're looking for but still flashed i would hope that maybe it was his illness that happened right before that game that led to elliot being more involved than he would have otherwise been we'll see if that turns out to be true or not through the next couple weeks but we also have javante williams that we can play either in that running back spot or as a flex but our four receivers of cd lamb amon ross st brown brandon Ayuk, and then zay flowers flowers is the interesting one there because he put up a lot of points in week one you love to see that when I watched the game, I was a little bit more disappointed because all of his targets are right there around the line of scrimmage. He's going to have to do a lot of yards after the catch if that's where he's going to catch all of his passes. He was able to do that in week one. 
it's difficult to sustain that level of production with that type of ADOT. Of course, if you catch that many passes, just the, the receptions alone are worth a lot more than many of the higher profile receivers scored last week. So to have those two positions relatively well addressed and to have some fun backup receivers as well, we have JSN on the bench. We've got guys like Wandale and Marvin Mims and Rasheed Rice, players who you're really looking for you know, say week five onward. I mean, that's one of the things I think is you go out there in week one and you have all these fun names and then they're not that involved. And even if you know how you put it together, which is that those are not week one plays, you're still kind of hoping in the back of your mind that maybe that guy will go off. Maybe with Jerry Judy not playing, Marvin Mims will go for 10 and 150. It's not impossible. Obviously, Puka had a very good NFL debut, and you think back to someone like an Anquan Bolden who went off from the very first minute he was on the field. You get some of those types of performances, but when we have the bench receiver set up like that to where we don't need him in week one, again, it gives us some possibility. So, Colin, what we were looking for more than the big names, and you and I did bid on Justice Hill. We did bid on Kendrick Bourne. I wrote at length in my article on Rotoviz this week about how much I actually do like Kendrick Bourne. And I don't think this is a one week flash in the pan. I think that he's going to be a big part of what the new England Patriots do because of our specific roster. We were a little bit less aggressive with those guys than we might've been on other teams. Yeah. And instead we added a couple of quarterbacks. Yeah. So we, the, there's going to be a couple of interesting things to talk about. Sean, you had on the running backs and, the wide receivers and i think this team is you know really set up well there the other part that you know it's week to week with the kicker but it is a team as well with tyler bass who we should be pretty locked in with him is week 13 by so that again when you're looking at the waivers on a weekly basis is something that you will have to consider both defense and kicker in this particular type of format and we were talking before the show we did go after a couple of defenses we got outbid on those we have still got the jacksonville defense they have kc this week sean may not be the best game to to target there but when we look at the positions of potential weakness and for me i don't think it's a weakness but it is a concern having two rookie tight ends and michael mayer obviously not being involved having a zero and week one was involved in terms of being active but but didn't get involved in the actual game plan and, and that could be one of those plays where you're talking about you know week five where it starts to come into play for him so we have sam laporta in that starting spot with how he did in week one i'm comfortable having him in there he was somebody i thought would have an impact straight away but there will be those growing pains too if we see low scoring weeks from him but we will see that from a lot of tight ends as well across the league where it can be quite volatile but when we look then at the position that we're kind of circling through here and see how it's going and just before we go into it the names are jared goff mac jones sam howell matthew stafford two of those names were drafted and sam howell jared goff the other to mac jones and stafford are two that we have picked up this week and stafford was a 15 dollars acquisition 35 dollars acquisition for mac jones we did sean the one that i when i mentioned tight end there the one that i probably would have not done is the the dropping of uh the dropping of trey mcbride but we may be able to pick him up next week ahead of you know waivers again to see how that plays out that would have continued that you know dev a little bit of option for the similar thing at, at the tight end position but when we look at the quarterbacks now that we have the question that i have before we go into like you know, picking starters then what we do after how we rotate them back out potentially you mentioned that they didn't hit last week we have in this format 16.55 for uh, goff we have 19.2 points for howell mac jones I don't think he's going to do this every week, but 28.3 for him. And then we have Stafford with 17.8. When you're looking for a hit at quarterback, are you looking for 20 points plus? Where, where's your cutoff when you're saying that they didn't, you know, hit in how we want it in week one? And, you know, it's not it's not really a score that will cost you the game either. No, it's not a score that will cost you the game. And that's one of the things we are trying to avoid are those real landmines. You think about... Uh, what happened with Aaron Rodgers just missing the game? You think about what happened with Daniel Jones. I'd like to get into a situation through volume where we can have a guy who's averaging in the low twenties. Yeah, and especially and if we have a, you get a you make it a sixteen one week, but then you get a, a thirty another week. You know. Yeah, and if we have a couple of the players, and as the season goes along, we have a lot of really good tools on the site. 
We have the strength of schedule streamer. We have the game level similarity projections. We have the advanced team stat tool, which will allow you to look at how the teams match up, pass rush, pass blocking, all of those different elements. We have the matchups tool on the individual player page, which gives you a lot of the Vegas information, how that stuff has played out, and then how the defenses that they faced in the last five games have allowed points to the position. So there are a lot of different ways that you can go through that. And one of the things I always like to mention is that if you think that you're going to stream or match up play a QB and it's going to just work, you're going to get the higher score from the two or three guys every week. That's not true, right? Football is going to have enough volatility and it's going to have enough fluky plays. It's going to have enough craziness that the chaos means you're not going to always play the better guy. But when you have those opportunities to play some matchups with two players who will work, then I like the potential scoring outcomes that we have. One of the things that I really want to do, and you know, we've mentioned our team, but it's a mention to kind of create a framework for the discussion here yeah. of how we're looking at team construction. When we have a spot that is weak, that is the spot where I want to throw numbers at it early and churn through some guys and see if answers come up. And so one of the things that we have with this is we now have four guys that to me are vaguely interesting. Because Jerry Goff's score in week one was not what we're looking for. But there are still plenty of reasons to believe that he could end up, especially in the right matchups, be a guy who is very playable and can give you some league winning outcomes, especially if Amon Ra is our wide receiver one. We're hoping that those two plays work together in concert to create some big games at some point. You have Sam Howell, who has a pretty decent fantasy profile and did some positive things in week one. I would like to think that his scoring levels can really increase when they need him to be more aggressive in the third and fourth quarters. So if you don't get the fourth quarter, which you really don't when you're playing the Arizona Cardinals, then that changes the dynamics. We didn't want to drop him because the upside is still there. You really want to see him play a couple more weeks, which again, this is the reason why that three, four play I think is interesting. Obviously Matthew Stafford, even though he didn't score well in week one, the running backs ended up with the touchdowns in that game, which, you know, that can always get you. A guy can play well, like Matthew Stafford, maybe the most impressive quarterback of the entire weekend. But if the touchdowns go to the running backs in that game, you lose out. That has been a little bit of a concern for the Rams at different times in the Sean McVay era. And you could say, well, I mean, Puka had a great start. Tutu had a great start. And yet there are reasons to believe that maybe you're not going to get elite touchdown scoring from the receiving group but we add staffer to the team we can watch him for a couple weeks we can see if this is a true breakout or just a little bit of a flash in the pan week one and then with mac jones the thing that jumps out to you with mac jones is that he threw 54 passes in the first week his actual yards per attempt just 5.9 you have some of the elements in the rain there some of the passes like the touchdown to, to kendrick bourne you know, the two touchdowns are very impressive. Some of the passes less impressive. There is the thought that the Patriots would actually like to really run this team behind a Ramondre Stevenson. Already we have these rumors that, you know, Juju could be, you know, phased out of the game plan. That part would, I think, be sad and unfortunate. It is also something that probably makes sense from a current talent and skill perspective. So you're thinking, well, where's the receiving value there that you're going to get the points? And yet, We've been believers in this Bill O'Brien offense. We've been believers in Mac Jones. I think that he can be one of the breakout quarterbacks for the season. So getting to look at these guys for a couple more weeks and seeing what part of week one was real and what part of week one was fluky is valuable, especially if the expense is somewhat minimal, right? We probably could have been a bit even lower on these guys, and yet we did want to see them because the rest of our roster is so strong. Now, you know, two weeks from now, that could not be the case, right? You can have injuries and suddenly you've got to make some adjustments, but you want to use your roster in the way that makes the most sense for maximizing your position of weakness and hitting on something that works there. The flip side of that would be that I have a number of main events where Puka was actually available. And even though it may not work out, we bid extremely high there because if what happened in week one does continue through, then he could be the answer. I mentioned on Stealing Bonanza the other night that Keenan Allen back in 2013 as a free agent pickup 
was a key piece of overcoming a Julio Jones injury on some of those big teams. You, you've got to be willing to make that aggressive play early to try and address something if week one is giving you information that is completely game-changing. And Colin Puka is not somebody that we were necessarily on. The thing for me when I think back on that is not so much as a prospect because there were things pointing in both directions. And it's not so much even the training camp hype. But that once it became clear that Cooper Cup was not going to be a guy who basically steps on the volume for everybody else in that offense because of the injury, that was probably the time to investigate that even more and to really think through, do you want your final picks to create exposure to him and Tutu Atwell? Tutu Atwell is someone we've recommended on the show. He had a fantastic game. The concern for some of those types of players in the contemporary NFL is that with defenses trying to limit the big plays as really just the strategy, you know, the overall philosophy that they have, you know going in that there's going to be the potential for more volatility for an air yards guy than someone who does that same amount of air yards but with twice as many targets right the receptions that you get with twice as many targets gives you that floor overall and it makes it i mean it's easier to have a good racer when you're dealing with more catchable targets or at least to have you know more consistency with it so you look through those things obviously Puka is going to be the guy that you're looking at there. But one of the things that shows up in our roster when we're playing it through the QB position is that we want to have some exposure to teams that maybe have the answers for 2023. And we want to create as many pathways as possible. So I guess for me, the main takeaway with week one waiver wire, where there is always a lot of stress because you're like, there are some guys, maybe they are now players where if you could do the draft again, you would draft them like in the sixth, seventh round, right? You would draft them very, very early. How do you want to spend your free agent budget? And, you know, where's that risk reward type of dynamic? Because, one of the things you can do is spend an extra 30 or 40 percent that you didn't need but you don't know and if you think that that is the guy then you want to go after so the way that this would be actionable for future weeks is to again be thinking through when we get something that is so game changing and it's not always in week one i mean week one is the very high anxiety high stress week with the waiver wire but there are going to be some moves in a week three, in a week six. You know, there's going to be a week. One of the things that can happen are guys like Wandale, like Jalen Hyatt. Jalen Hyatt was dropped in our yeah. league. You know, you could potentially have a week from now. Like if Jerry Judy comes back and has a good game, you could have a Marvin Mims dropped. Certainly someone like a Rasheed Rice. He flashed in week one. But if he isn't involved in weeks two and three, he wasn't very involved in that second half, which was disappointing. He could be dropped. And then five weeks from now, these guys really blow up. So then you're faced with the issue of, well, if you spent most of your budget in week one, you're probably not involved in it, but there are going to be lots of teams as well who are more like ours, where we spent a relatively limited amount because the big pickups didn't make sense for us. You want to be thinking through like how big of a change can this guy make? My philosophy for the waivers column is to go very big or to mostly go very small. And so... <laughs> When I'm going in and working with co-managers, I'm usually encouraging us to increase our high bids and to decrease our low bids, which may seem a little bit weird in its own way, but anything that's kind of in that you know 30 to 100 range, and this is out of 1,000, I'm usually looking to pull back. Because I'm like, if that's where we are with them, then we probably don't have to have them. And They're players you, that are going to be nice to see rather than must have to be in your lineup instantly exactly and anytime that you're thinking 35 and we did as we said bid 35 on mac but anytime you're bidding 35 there's a pretty good chance that one would have worked and so you can save the 34 and if you save the 34 seven or eight different times then i mean that's an entire additional impact player that you can get because you went with one instead of 35 when you're at 550 then I mean you're basically saying this guy changes 
the entire season for us. So, so maybe you want to go like 714 and make sure you get them. Because if you're willing to go 550, I mean, you wanted to have that player. You thought that that player was the difference between winning your league and maybe winning a million dollars and sitting out, not having anything to root for in that final weekend. So thinking through it, that's the way that I like to play the waivers. What other things should we be thinking about as we're trying to make these either subtle moves or franchise changing moves to transform our redraft rosters after the first week and kind of thinking through, you know, we've got another waiver possibility on Sunday. And sometimes it's those Sunday waivers, again, for just one or $2 that will be the ones that actually won or lost the league for you. And then as we kind of look forward to week ahead type of pickups, because I mean, when we're talking about the waiver wire, one of the reasons why you know, I maybe don't spend as much time on that analysis is that it's almost like these start sit decisions where everybody has basically the same idea. But if you can start to do good analysis on the week ahead, and that'll be part of the zero RB report for this year as well. A lot of times, depending on when that article comes out, you know, I'll get feedback of, I mean, this would have been more helpful before waivers. And yet <laughs> it's more helpful if I do a good job on the article, right? Yeah. And if it's thoughtful enough and has the information people need to really be developing for themselves the ability to make these moves ahead. Again, so you're spending one as opposed to spending 600. I mean, we get a sense of who these backups are going to be. I mean, Colin, for me, one of the things that you know I'm noticing from the Josh Kelly and the Kyron Williams situations is that the back behind them is the player who becomes really interesting to me because we have a pretty good sense that those guys can play but they're not NFL difference makers. I mean, Zach Evans, when you look at this offense where Cam Akers already being phased out and Zach Evans is the biggest talent, that gets me right back to this play where like, maybe he is the guy. So that will be one of the things that we're thinking through as opposed to, you know, let's spend 800 or 900 on Kyron Williams. Not even to say that that's a bad play because there was a, a league where he was actually the contingent bid behind Puka in a situation where the contingent bid was 700. So... I mean, you have a sense of what the actual top bid line was there. Sean was uh, flashing the cash in, in that particular format. Sean, you touched on a couple of things there. I know you asked me a question, but I'm going to go through a couple of things here. You mentioned the luck ahead bids. And for example, before week one, there would have been waivers that ran. People in their redraft leagues may have picked up Hookah once the news came out that we weren't going to have Cooper Cup. He was going to be on the engine reserve for the four weeks to start the season. And something that playing and having rosters along with you that I think often is Sean is the king of the $1 bid. And it might be a week before, it might be two weeks ahead. And this is kind of when people are probably wondering why would a roster have four quarterbacks on it at this point of the season? Why do you do that? Well, it's so you're not putting in those huge, huge bids down the line when they have a prime matchup. And maybe quarterback isn't the clearest example for that, but there's a lot of times where will carry two defenses and Sean will be looking ahead for defensive matchups in future weeks. And then you get them on a $1 bid. And then when the waiver reports come out the following week, you'll see that people are paying into the triple digits for those particular players. So I think looking ahead, Sean, when we talk about some of the draft strategies we use or some of the things that we try and do and the dynasty leagues, for example, and we sometimes will call them superpowers or supercharging your roster. But I, I do think the $1 bids and looking ahead is, kind of a, a superpower for a season-long redraft league in particular to set those rosters up i think people could gain a lot from trying to do that and look ahead because a lot of the waiver wires that we do see are reactionary where it's what happened this week and then trying to get those into your lineups and as you mentioned that leads to very high bids and week one is probably the most we'll see that but we will see that throughout and we'll see rosters that then do not have the ability of the week one waiver wire pickup doesn't work out to recover and have a team that's going to push on throughout the entire season so one dollar bid sean anything to add on that before we we do go into the question that you did ask well i would say first i'm not the king of the one dollar bids but i do appreciate you claiming that it, the one dollar bids though are very important and if you have spent say 800 in the first week on a player 
you know, it, it can come out in the second week and that player doesn't play well. You can come out in the second week and that player gets injured. It's a similar type of thing to, you know, if your fifth or sixth round draft pick gets injured, where there's no simple way to replace the value of sixth round pick or to replace the value of 800 bidding units. But you do have to keep some flexibility. And so one of the things that you have to be thinking if you're going to make an $800 bid or a $900 bid, an $850 bid, is now... I still need to make a lot of transactions, which means a lot of $1 bids in the future. And you've got to do a good job with those, right? You're going to need to turn over a lot of your roster. And so again, it's right back to that thing of every individual transaction. And if a lot of those are $1, you, you do get to make more moves. Even if you're saying, well, how can $1 moves make a difference? As you were referencing there, sometimes it is those $1 moves that will end up determining a season. They, they will. And the other part then that I was going to move into is the reactions and the overreactions, and you mentioned certain players that are, you know, already available in waivers, and they, they would have been later picks, the likes of a, a Jalen Hyatt, for example. But you know, a player who potentially would have been dropped, we're recording just before Thursday night football. But for example, Rashad Penny was inactive this past week, and we had Gainwell get the lead amount of the work, and then we have Boston Scott and DeAndre Swift behind them. Gainwell going to miss out in Thursday night football. Obviously, that dynamic may have made people hold on to Penny, but I, I've seen him dropped in some leagues you know being inactive and people maybe needing to pick up a, a wide receiver or another position to have available this week how should people try and manage those decision points of you know when you were talking about the rookies for example marvin mims has you know 2.9 points wendell robinson wasn't active wasn't really expected to be active this particular week maybe better off not being active in a 40 to zero outcome but michael mayer for example a tight end maybe you have two tight ends and maybe one of them is somebody you think can start and you have a Michael Mayer or a Trey McBride and cutting those guys for the particular week. I think with younger players that don't perform in particular and players who are in the double digit rounds and beyond, they are usually the ones that, you know, get the the immediate cut in those leagues. What would your, you know, as a lot of our listeners will have drafted those younger players and will need to have that process where hopefully the starting lineup is going to take them through those opening weeks, then from, you know, week five, six, seven, as the uh, bye weeks come in, they will be ready to, to roll. You know, my, my advice on those would be just to really try to not not move those guys on at this particular point of the season. Yeah, I think it's going to depend a lot on the size of your league because, if you have a, a limited enough number of roster spots and there are going to be some really good free agent options every week, I think you can churn through it yeah. and you're, you're still doing kind of the look ahead idea. You're keeping an eye on your guys sitting out there on free agency and being ready to add them a week early as opposed to a week late. But I think you can move them to free agency for right now and roster some guys who are more involved. If you're playing in leagues that are similar to the FFPC, for example, where you're going to have 18 sort of true roster spots and then kicker and defense, I think it is important to continue to stash those players because once they do hit, what you have to pay to get them back does not necessarily... It's too much, right, to have given them up originally unless... There is a clear-cut guy. So that's one of the areas in which I think Kendrick Bourne... It's not something your accountant would recommend to give it away for free and pack it up for $800 in two weeks' time. Yeah, and, and it's it's one of these things where you don't recommend that. You don't want to do it that way. And yet if you do do it that way, you need to be psychologically free enough you need to, to just for the do it. Potential. Yeah, Because... One of the things about the dynasty, we talk all the time about, okay, perpetual reloading. And this is kind of the, the secondary topic for the show here. And we can kind of transition into that. Think about the perpetual reloading. In 30 roster spot dynasty leagues, which a lot have, you can really do that because you can stash a lot of your guys. The FFPC leagues where you have 20 roster spots, if you've done a lot of perpetual reloading, you've created a lot of draft value you're often going to be able to trade that away. Sometimes you make a huge mistake like I did where I got right down to the deadline in one of the leagues. And I just, I couldn't give up on sky more because I had a variety of chiefs wide receivers. I'm like, I, I want to make sure I have the guy who hits. If I had just traded sky more, I would have gotten some of the value back out, but you're 
creating an environment there where you might have to drop someone that you're excited about. I think about Rashid Shahid, for example, as someone that had in a bunch of leagues and did have to cut. And then on some of the leagues went right back in and bid a lot for him. Right. And it can be that kind of situation where you're thinking, I just cut this guy a week ago. There's no way I'm either going to admit the mistake or just pay that much to get someone back whom I already had. You just emotionally, that's too difficult. It's important to make the right decision regardless of what previous decisions you made. But we do want to kind of set the stage to do that as little as possible, which means that you don't want to chase. Uh, one of the things that I, I think we've mentioned before, Colin, but it's like the main thing that you want to make sure you avoid doing with waivers is do not pick up someone who doesn't have league winning upside and you're not going to play this week. Because there are guys who are going to have a decent enough workload that they're going to outscore your bench players. They're almost certainly going to outscore them. They're going to look better on the roster in terms of like I had a guy who scored points this week. There is a little bit of a blocking value, but I mean, you're just blocking one, one other team, right? It's not like that guy is going to go and play for all 11 other teams. If you could block 11 other teams, then, you know, maybe, but you're going to only block one of the 11 by having that player on your roster. If you're not going to play him this week, don't cut someone who has, it's not actually league winning upside, but a difference making upside for the second half of the season. And that's one of the things where like a starter upside on your particular roster. Exactly. Exactly. And when you think about the tight end position, that's another position where on some of our teams we're keeping quite a few because it's still very unclear who's going to emerge. And that was, I think, I mean, for me, it was maybe the most frustrating thing. Now, certainly the injuries are the most frustrating thing, but the most frustrating thing that's not about, like an entire season being ruined is the situation with the Cardinals where Zach Ertz gets all these targets and Trey McBride is not very involved, but on the two plays where they target him, you're like, Oh, he looks awesome. It's like, John, do the Cardinals going to coaches? To, they are <laughs> going to have to figure this out. This cannot continue. So in some leagues I did cut Trey McBride because I mean, even if he hits, even if he's the guy, I mean, there was no value for Zach Ertz in that game because the passes because, were of yeah. such low quality. Yeah, but also his attempts to catch them were of such low quality. It was interesting to me because well, I did have a I did have a DM that I forgot to forward to you, but it was around the fact that we weren't harsh enough on Zach Ertz on the the recap, and they were hoping that we would the the it, it was around the fact that they were listening to the second recap show and that they were sure that we would have like circled back to going harder on Zach Ertz. So this is your chance, Sean, if you want to do it. <laughs> Well, I just I was proud of Zach Ertz for getting himself out in the game and, and drawing all those targets. I did feel like his play on the ball in the game was not particularly strong. And so it's interesting because you have all this advanced info. I mean, advanced. You can kind of debate whether that word makes sense or not. But all of the charting information that we have in the tools through SIS and all the different sort of stuff. So I'm looking at these and I'm looking at the drops and, and someone like Puka, for example, was charted with, I think three drops, which is, I mean, he had a very good game for three drops. You think about what, you know, maybe could have been there. I guess that those didn't stand out to me in the game. I might dispute if, whether or not that was the case. Zach Ertz was charted for zero drops. And I was like, I think there were a couple of plays in the game I could have made. Like I, I you know, think that again, person may not have watched the entire Cardinals game this week. So we don't need to go more. <laughs> I, I have also thing. I have also found the comment, Sean, while while you were talking it came in from Brian, and it was that he was listening to part two of the recap show. He was admittedly disappointed that Sean in part one didn't make reference about Ertz going from a tight end that uh catches and fell down to a tight end that misses catches and fell down. So he made Ooh, catches and fell line. down. That's a good line. We'll have to we'll have to work that in on future episodes. Yeah, hopefully so. not for many weeks hopefully maybe just week two and then we get trey mcbride catching all those balls yeah credit to brian on that that's a that's an excellent one there yeah so i think that you can cut trey bride trey mcbride in some of the leagues because i mean the cardinals offense isn't going to work anyway and yet you do want to i mean you think about a michael mayer and you think about the fact that the raiders in some ways look good right and we're going to need that third piece to go with Devontae Adams, to go with Jacoby Myers. Jacoby Myers, I thought, was maybe the story of the weekend. And it was really unfortunate 
that he suffers the injury at the end. I'm hoping that he will be okay for, if not week two, then for week three. But you want to, again, create opportunities with players who have a wide range of outcomes as we look to weeks three, weeks four, weeks five, if you can get across week two. And it's not to say you should ever be throwing away an actual starting spot. You do need to address those starting spots. But my bench, I want to be seated with wide range of outcomes players, players who have a lot of contention upside, and to make sure that as we get into the bye weeks, that the players you have on your bench have the pos- have the potential to make a difference for you. You think through that with the dynasty rosters as well, where Colin, we went ahead and released Damian Harris, picked up Hunter Henry, even though we already had a lot of tight end firepower on that team. That is a situation which is a little bit different and is one where we're actually thinking about this from the perspective of tight end is our strength, but you have a lot of flex positions. It's the RV triflex format, uh, <laughs> kind of right there in the name. And to have Friermuth, Ingram, Laporta, but then to be able to add Hunter Henry, that's a situation where I think the blocking value is more substantial because he can be the guy this season. And if we run into some other issues, someone like a Friermuth or an Ingram might draw enough trade value. So one of the things that I tend to see in Dynasty is that during the offseason, these tight ends, people have skepticism with them because they're thinking, I can do it through numbers. You know, I'll draft a bunch of guys or I'll construct my roster in such a way that I have four different shots at the tight end position. One of those guys will hit. I'm not going to pay you for a tight end. You go through a month where you don't score any tight end points and it's really dragging <laughs> your team down. You're much more likely to pay for an Evan Ingram, to pay for a Pat Fryermuth at that point. So from a dynasty perspective, we're also wanting to lean into the strengths in order to increase our options for this perpetual reloading element. Because if we don't have the you know, Hunter Henry to potentially put in there, then our ability to trade some of these other tight ends is more limited. Is that how you would be thinking through the Hunter Henry selection as well. Again, it's kind of a situation where right now our bench at running back is Roshan, DeAndre Swift, Antonio Gibson. Certainly there were some pluses and minuses for that group this last week. You know, disappointing with Swift. You know, disappointing in some ways with Antonio Gibson. Obviously, from a redraft perspective, we've been on Brian Robinson, so we were happy with that part of it. But Roshan looks very good. A player like Damian Harris doesn't seem to be someone who is going to make a difference. And so even though Hunter Henry is actually somebody that I had to cut on a variety of these triflex teams, when we have a shot at him here, we go pretty high. We get him back onto this roster. I love how our reanimated team here is looking, Colin. Yeah. And you mentioned Henry and we've talked about this a few times, but his kind of resurgence and and value, or I, I don't even know value is the right word because I don't know how much you would actually be able to acquire for him or, you know, and, and dynasty, but from where he was four months ago to where he is now and how it's flipped with him and Mike Gusecki. And I, I think that Gusecki will still be very, very usable this season with the Patriots and fantasy. But Henry, for example, when you talked about players and popping them into the starting lineup and could they go into the starting lineup, he would have actually been our highest scoring non-quarterback last week outside of Justin Jefferson on this roster. He got 19.10 points in this format it is tight end premium but those tight ends can really rack up points in a, in a major way on the roster and the this is a team where i think we will probably start you know you can start a tight end and then you have your two regular flexes plus a super flex and, and i can see sean that we may end up playing two or more tight ends on a weekly basis this week we're probably set up to play three the reason for that being jerry judy uh still obviously health question marks rondell moore we talked about the arizona cardinals question marks jameson williams uh suspended justin ross see how he works out in regular season action then quentin johnson working his way in to you know the starting lineup for the chargers so there is some question marks around the other positions and having somebody like a hunter henry there is going to allow us to maybe work through some of those moments to set us up for success this season we did, Sean, go pretty hard after him. You mentioned it was a Harris, you know, that we dropped Damian Harris, but 
we bet at three oh five. The next highest bid was one nine eight. So, you know, I think that's a fair amount to be in excess of another bid. You never know what other people are going to bid, but it, it wasn't the case that you bid three oh five and the other person bid you know three dollars. Uh, there was quite a, a gap, or, or quite a little gap, in my opinion, with the one hundred and seven dollar difference. So, I, I think that's the kind of a player that can be a difference maker throughout the season, particularly when we look at not just this week but when we get into the bye week see as somebody who definitely will allow for depth to fill in at both tight end and the the flex position so i like how that turned out this is a roster though sean when we've talked about it you know the jerry judy would have been included in this particular core but it is george pickens deandre hopkins and justin jefferson as the three kind of core pieces at the wide receiver position along with jerry judy who hopefully when he's up and running and healthy but running back Mostert's in there Kenneth Walker the one then that I mentioned you know DeAndre Swift it's gonna be very interesting to see how Thursday night football goes and it's going to be tough the reports coming out with the Eagles is like you know some weeks it's going to be like week one some weeks he's going to get all the work he can handle and it's like that's not what I want to hear because (laughs) well that answer is just purely saying you know we're not going to tell you at all how this yeah and they have there's no there's no prerogative on the Eagles to tell us anything that's like does not help them win games but it also is like when you're setting your lineup for thursday night football you're like hmm that doesn't feel like somebody i'm confident so we now have the eagles along with arthur smith who uh, are trying to they don't care about fantasy neither does uh, drake london though that's the main thing uh so we are set up pretty well with this roster sean and uh, i'm excited to see how we manage it throughout the season you mentioned some of the cuts we had some cut downs in this as well to get down to 20 spots before the season we were trying to move some players there wasn't as much trade action so we did kind of trim basically the players who were of of least value and uh, basically by adp or what you would be able to get back so you never know sean some of those guys may end up back on our rosters but we'll keep a close eye on what happens with both of those teams off to one and oh starts with both of them hopefully we get to two and oh this week and we can head on towards some championships in 2023 hopefully our listeners are doing the same any final waiver thoughts sean before we we close out here well colin we had some trade questions we had a question about garrett wilson and aj brown in dynasty obviously wilson's short-term value takes a huge hit with the quarterback situation i think in some ways we can wrap that in with another interesting dynamic that i have witnessed in some of these leagues where i am getting more trade offers you have some managers out there who are very active in the rv triflex formats which is you know a lot of fun it's what you want to see and in the league where bjorn and i drafted Bijan robinson at the 111 we've had a lot of offers even from teams with elite quarterbacks offers that included justin fields offers that included jalen hurts now it wouldn't be a one for one jalen hurts b john robinson i think that is a pretty clear cut except but if you're going to get hurts and have to give up robinson plus and one of the things that you know is good news bad news in our situation is that we built this team really for 2024 and forward it performed well in week one sometimes that's going to change how you look at things but we didn't leave ourselves probably enough flexibility at the running back position just the way that the draft fell out and so it's really Bijan and nothing else at running back if we traded him it would just be nothing for, for two running back spots that you know does start to prejudice your team in the direction of it being a pure punt which if you've won and scored a lot of points in week one you might want to do might not want to do but when we're looking at Bijan versus quarterbacks that's an interesting question when we're looking at wilson versus brown that's an interesting question column sort of two parts to this quick reaction what would you do in those trades and then the second part how are you thinking about those elements when we know that we've just gotten one week of information and we could be seeing very different things you know a couple days from now so sean on a similar note on those i i was offered a couple of and one league offered two scenarios that i had garrett wilson and on that team i have cd lamb as well and it was a case of 
uh, it was an Aaron Rodgers team, unfortunately, so lacking a little bit of quarterback depth. And I was offered Justin Fields for either one of those two wide receivers. And I didn't go for it. I'll be interested to see if it's one that you would have went for in a super flex format. But I, I have concerns about what the Bears are actually doing. And this week they looked so bad, but even post... The more I've dug into that game after the fact, the play, some of the plays that the Bears were running, I have no idea. You know who was meant to be the intended target at wide receiver. Everyone's covered. There's nothing open. Looks like some of these plays are you know, run pass options where the run is the clear option, but Justin Fields is holding it for to try and pass it, and he's getting himself into trouble. The other parts of it are you know we get the huge rush and upside from him, but. Whether it's going to be him or whether it's going to be his wide receivers, I just don't know if this passing game is actually going to function enough for him to reach the potential that we maybe hope that he could. And in baseball and season long, you know, I'm, I, I would be happy to have him on the roster because I do think there's going to be massive weeks for him. But I'm not 100% sure as to how long Justin Fields is the starting quarterback of the Chicago Bears if it continues in this way. Do you have the that's same an interesting take that? on it? Because I think that's the only thing that knocks him out of. I mean, maybe he could fall out of the first round. I think it's the only thing that knocks him out, certainly of the first two rounds of Superflex Dynasty, you know, kind of startup value, you could say. And I think it's, I mean, one of the I, I things that we a, have, there's especially there's on teams Kelton, where we. It's like a Kelton this, point this season. Where if it's going like this, the blame will start to be shifted to, you know, obviously the coaching staff and the organization, but there's going to be a firm amount of this put on Justin Fields. It's not a case that he's a rookie now, like we're expecting him to do things. And, you know, the Bears were expecting him to do things week one and their fans, and he did not do things week one. Yeah, and it gets to this point about how big the moat is, and that you know, it's something that we discuss as it relates to the zero RB list and how you want to draft running backs, where one of the reasons why you want talent beyond the fact <laughs> that it's going to lead in many cases to efficiency. And despite the way a lot of people think about it, efficiency will lead to fantasy scoring in a meaningful way. But the more talented player has a bigger moat. They can have more things go wrong than, say, a Rashad White, for example. Well, you think about it from the perspective of the Bears and also think about it from the perspective of the Bengals. And in both of these situations, we've been here before where, I mean, Justin Fields looked like he might be out of the NFL after four weeks last season. And then he goes on this epic run. I mean, just pure scorched earth to where he's one of the best fantasy quarterbacks ever the rest of that season. It's still different because the Bears are not being judged on the fantasy results. You need to win some in reality. The fact that the and I Bengals, believe I believe I could be wrong on this, but I think that loss to the Packers may have been their tenth consecutive loss in a row. So they lost nine to finish last season, lost one to start this season. So it's very different than the Bengals, who lose in the AFC Championship game last year, who lose in the Super Bowl the previous season. The fact that they never look like they've practiced when they go into Week One is less catastrophic <laughs> because they have that track record. The situation with Fields, for me, is that NFL teams are desperate for quarterbacks and the rushing value in the right offense. And you think about, again, I, I'm hoping that Anthony Richardson does well. And there were a lot of bright spots in week one for the Colts, specifically, I think a lot of bright spots, specifically when you look at the coaching staff. And with Fields, there is going to be a coach out there at least beyond whatever happens this year in Chicago, where that coach is like, you know, you just need me <laughs> coordinating this offense and we'll be fine. So I don't think that there's a, if you ended up not being the quarterback in Chicago, that might even be better for him. So I don't think that that is a huge problem. When you have a, a weak armed quarterback who can't run and they play poorly, you know, you think of the Zach Wilson situation. I mean, then all of your value just evaporates because you can't play and you're going to be benched and, you know, you get this opportunity that he has now. And really what most people are thinking is the Jets absolutely have to address this in some other way. You know, if they had Justin Fields, that wouldn't be what people were thinking. Now, it might be a case where it still didn't turn out to be a great environment for 
Garrett Wilson. But I mean, like right now, if the Jets had a legitimate trade offer for Justin Fields, where the Bears wanted to start over with somebody else, and they'd certainly accept that, right? Because Justin Fields is going to be able to do things for you. So I guess and I'm not. I, I, I agree with you on the Russian side of things, but you know, just looking through his career numbers here, Justin Fields has never had a 300 yard passing game. In terms of like to finish last season, he had 75 yards passing, 119, 152, 254, 153, 167, 123, 151. You know, last season he had two games plus 200 yards. One was 208, one was 254. The rest are all sub 200, most of them you know, sub 175. And, and that's, you know, when we're talking about Anthony Richardson and we talk about like Justin Fields may be the plus side of that, but also. You know, three years into your NFL career, you should have. Well, obviously, that's been Harsey's two and one game, and but we should have you know, some games of more than two hundred and seventy-five yards. Sorry, I got distracted a little bit there because I was getting images of you like giving me the the numbers to input into the lost computer to keep <laughs> us from suffering. The, I thought at one point I had started to go through the numbers, and then I thought I just can't read out numbers. For, you know, I can't go factory all these weeks they're just they're all under 300 <laughs> yeah i mean the the passing production has to be there but i do think that a lot of this falls on the coordinator and i think the coordinator will realize they're going to take steps forward but one of the things that came out this week that just it really does shock you a little bit is when a beat reporter is saying that the the bears are sort of stunned by what happened and that <laughs> is always disconcerting so i I think that it's kind of weird because on the one hand i think the logic would tell me that justin fields a just in and of himself and b in terms of the positional value is still worth more than a b john robinson and yet one of the reasons i had b john robinson a little bit above adp in dynasty was because we had so much evidence to suggest that he was a truly generational prospect. And I feel like if anything, week one, and Ben and I did a lot on this, more stats, what have you, on this discussion. Make sure you check that out. But if anything, week one convinced me more than ever that the gap between the true stars and everybody else at running back is not only meaningful for reality, but will continue to be more and more meaningful in fantasy football which I think is, I mean, both of those takes are at least mildly controversial. And Bijan was that good that when you get those trades immediately following that type of game, and again, it's a game where Tyler Algier also scored a ton of points. Now he's going to be involved. I think you can look at that either direction. You can look at it this, you know, it's super fluky that Bijan Robinson would have been able to score that many points in a shared committee with Algier and Algier probably will continue to be involved, and they're not always going to have you know, that large of a pie. But the flip side of it would be that, like, even with how good Algier is, how many games can you go through where you're giving him the ball when, when you have Bijan Robinson? And so, I mean, you're going to get some 30 point games from Robinson this season at the running back position. And one of the things that has been kind of a through line for us all offseason is that in super flex formats, that have any kind of mitigating element with the QB scoring. You want to not overpay for the QBs and you want to be on the stars at other positions because they have more value in the super flex than quarterbacks do in some, in in many cases or they, they allow you to do some additional things. So don't, it's not a thing of fade the quarterbacks it's a thing of don't immediately default to QB as being the only choice. I think if you think of it a bit like we were talking about when you're picking players up with waivers, they have to be somebody who can impact your roster in a major way. And I, I think it's much easier to replace those 18 to 20 quarterback points than it is to replace, say, those 25 to 30 points that B. John Robinson or you say C.D. Lamb might put up. Oh, so you're going to throw C.D. Lamb out there as... Uh, I am, yeah. What? Well, he was one of the players that I had in that Justin Fields trade that I right, didn't do. Right, right. Tell no, me it's, I'm wrong. No, I just... 
<laughs> the Cowboys have the potential to be a weird team. I I had such a viscerally negative reaction to the Cowboys defense playing that well. If in fact oh, we all did, Sean. We, okay. I said it the Cowboys defense and Cowboys fans, maybe, but we all did. And I, I, don't even I, have... I went to bed on Sunday night thinking this is cruise control in our main event, and then I wake up and the Cowboys defense have put up thirty nine points. I'm like, this this isn't finished yet. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's from the perspective of not even being very heavily invested in the Giants. And one mm-hmm. of the players that we had as both like a, a personal favorite and that we're rooting for him, we think he's very good, but also a clear fantasy sell at price was a Darren Waller. You know, so the, and we don't have any exposure to Saquon Barkley. We have very limited exposure to Daniel Jones. I mean, all of those things were fine, and yet you still just want to see fun games. And you also, you know, if you have some exposure to CeeDee Lamb, you don't want this to be a team. Oh, you, yeah, well, that well you, doesn't you need, need to throw to them this year. To, you need to have them to need to score points. If the defense is, you know, shellacking the offense of the other team, I'm sure, Sean, you may have seen the reports, you know, from the. For, <laughs> the 49ers hoping that you know the Steelers offense would do something to give the 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 offense of the 49ers a break during the game no that's how bad it was getting that the you know the offense was out there all the time for the 49ers so they you know they were just gassed that is absolutely hilarious I hadn't run across that yeah it one of the things that I put in the article this week and again, it's not like this is any groundbreaking thing. Everybody knows this, but it's helpful to look at it, which is a list of the players who had scored five points or fewer at the wide receiver position in week one and had gone on to score 250 or more. And I mean, 200 is a pretty good number. If you get 200, you're pretty happy with most of the receivers, probably outside of the guys you draft in rounds one and two. I mean, you'd love for them to score 250 or more. Are you sure it's a- just going to be on that? T. Higgins going to do that this year, yeah. Well, it was in reference to T. Higgins and Drake London and, and Christian Kirk, even though all three of those guys actually are in very different categories in terms yeah. of how we would think about them. But one of the names that did jump out to me was CeeDee Lamb from just last year. And how, I mean, one of the things I was maybe the most frustrated of everything that happened last year in week one was cd lamb yeah that was somebody tough. we had drafted at the one two turn and then he goes on and has a great year right so even though they didn't need to do anything in week one he could still go on to a great year column in our main event that might be the player i'm most concerned about again because you just you need this team to score mike mccarthy has i mean he's been another one of these guys where and matt irby had a great article about how he's actually doesn't actually play and coach the way that he talks so that's something to keep in mind something to know but certainly, if they're able to just go out and pound people and not need to attack through the air, I mean, you know that there's going to be a little bit of that, you know, twinkle in his eye of, look, we didn't need Kellen Moore. We didn't need to go, you know, with some aerial blitzkrieg attack in order to win. We could do it my way. Through week one, we don't really have answers to that because the Giants were so inept. Yeah, I, I think it's more a case we don't have answers. And I have concerns about McCarthy, and obviously, it was a long time Green Bay Packers coach help them you know coach them to the super bowl coach that Aaron Rodgers team i think you'll have ups and downs with him from week to week but sean you know the when we've calibrated now what we're looking for in fantasy football between like you know the atlanta falcons being the lower tier and then everything else that we want to happen above that I, you know he's not my major concern at this moment in time but uh cd lamb's not a concern he's gonna he's gonna tear things up the rest of the way don't don't worry about that um, but that is going to bring us to the end. We we were planning to jump on here, talk for you know thirty minutes, have a nice short show today, almost uh, sixty minutes in the books. But I've enjoyed it. Hopefully, everyone who's listening in has enjoyed it. Check out all of Sean's work up on rotaviz.com as well. As always, we will be back post week two. Obviously, Stealing Bananas will be doing their stuff as well. The key thing is to subscribe to the Rotoviz Overtime Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to Stealing Bananas as well. There will be an instant reaction up on one of those right after the games probably this week with everything going on we'll be stealing banana side of things and then we'll have that schedule firmed up but looking forward to week two hopefully you win those fantasy matchups myself and sean will be rooting for you we'll also be rooting for ourselves sean hopefully we get those wins as well but until we are back my name is colin kelly you can follow me on twitter at over to martin my co-host is sean siegel check out sean's work up on rotaviz.com and until we are back have a good one